Thank you. Welcome, uh, <laughs> welcome everyone for this third day. Uh, so the first talk for the third day is uh, by Christian Eckenmayer, uh, who's giving his second talk uh, in the series. And uh, the title is Implementing Geometric Complexity Theory on the Separation of Orbit Closures via Symmetries. So thank you very, very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much for um, coming here for the second talk. This is uh, actually, yeah, so I, I do see some people survive the first one. So this is going to be, of course, not this workshop type talk, but this is more of a conference type talk, because now we are in the conference part. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so let me try this app here. Okay, so I want to um, talk about multiplicity obstructions. And uh, then about the connection between orbit and orbit closure, which is given by the uh, fundamental invariant. And I give some proof ideas how this relates to the tableaus that we've seen last time. Um, yeah, so multiplicity obstructions, okay. And, uh, and uh, they give you the main result of the paper and uh, what it does exactly and what type of multiplicity obstructions it, ob it obtains for which problem, okay. Um, in GCT, we often want to prove that some variety does not lie in another variety, right? So that's the whole point in, in, in GCT is that you have um, classically here, it's um, the permanent. permanent. Oh, can I, can no. I use this pointer here? Perfect. So you have the permanent and <clears throat> so, and you compare it with a determinant. <clears throat> Um, so there are some issues here with the indices, where so there's the permanent M is determinant P of M. So there's some function um, P that's growing, say polynomially, and uh, you want uh, to prove that uh, such a non-inclusion here holds for every P if you, uh, every polynomial P if you make M large enough. So this here is, a, is the padded permanent that we have seen uh, several times, right? You take the permanent polynomial, and uh, since its degree is not the same as the degree of the determinant, you have to uh, multiply it by a power of a variable. Just actually any linear form is, is possible here. And uh, you get an orbit closure here on the left hand side and an orbit closure on the right hand side. You'll get, your goal is to, to separate these, right? So that's the setup um, classically. And uh, we've already seen um, that was, that a, was a, a bit a while ago that one can actually remove this padding from the situation by saying okay i uh, i only look at the permanent orbit not the padded permanent orbit i take a bit of different group this is a still a gl still just a general linear group but now it's gl m times p of m squared just more variables just still a general linear group and this is the number of variables that I have in this iterated matrix product polynomial. Okay, so I think the last time I wrote IMM, and this time I chose IMP, uh, because, yeah, I'm not sure. IMM is perfectly fine as well, but there's also imminence, and imminence, I don't want to let, because there's determinant permanent, and there's imminence also in between this, so I don't want people to confuse things. Maybe IMP is fine. So, yeah, it's a polynomial here. Uh, and you compare two orbit closures, um, and there's no padding involved, right? So that's great. But as uh, Josh Grotcho pointed out already, uh, there's still an issue here because this is uh, still this group here. Um, it's a, it's not a GLM, right? So if you, or uh, well, it's not a GLM squared. You you what you want to have is the GLM squared here. Um, and uh, and the permanent. So you want actually the number of variables to be the number number of variables here in your polynomial. Uh, you could do that, but then these two groups here would have different number of variables and you don't want that as well. So there's all kinds of uh, problems here, um, even without the padding. So now in this paper here, we go into a case where we don't have these problems. So we just go to a much simpler case, which is um, you're comparing GLM orbits of two polynomials that are actually polystable. Right? This is the simplest case, I guess, because we are avoiding a lot of trouble. Um, and what we are comparing is uh, the power sum polynomial, um, just x1 to the m plus x2 to the m plus and so on plus xm to the m. And here on the other side is the product of variables and its orbit closure. So this orbit closure here, you know, 
is just the polynomials homogeneous of degree m that uh, in m variables that can be written as a product of homogeneous linear polynomials. And these ones here are just the homogeneous degree m polynomials in m variables that have a border wall in rank at most m. Okay, so these two orbit closures are fairly familiar to us. And a non-inclusion here is uh, what we prove is though um, that result on its own is actually fairly easy to prove. So there's nothing spectacular about this non-inclusion. You could actually just look at the dimensions of these uh, orbit closures and see that the left one is bigger than the right one. So there's really nothing too special about this. But in this specific setup, we can actually uh, implement the whole GCT approach and give explicit multiplicity obstructions. So that is the, um, it's just a much, it's just, a, I mean, we call it in the paper, we call it the toy problem. And uh, yeah, it says that the power sum polynomial does not factor as a product of homogeneous linear polynomials. And we need there, yeah, M, M should be at least three for this. Okay, so this is a simpler case. Actually, let me also say it's a simpler case because we are polystable, but the methods that we use, they do not actually use polystability and they do generalize. So in, in small cases, I did some calculations. So these things do generalize <clears throat> beyond polystability also. So there's hope that one can actually, um, yeah, it's, so the, the, the theory works well with the polystability, but uh, the proofs actually are more general than that. All right, so um, what's the multiplicity obstructions or like a quick reminder, our group G should now be always the group GLM. And we have two orbit closures. And uh, if one sits in the other, then uh, we get a surjection on the coordinate rings. We've also, yeah, we all, we've seen this also yesterday in Visual Stalk, for example, something like this happening, right? Uh, so you get a surjection of the functions and um, yeah, now, now both homogeneous degree delta components here of these coordinate rings are finite dimensional vector spaces. And a finite dimensional vector space with a group action, because the group action, uh, we still have the group action on the functions. Like Viso was usually talking about invariance. So there's a group action, but there's not only invariance. I mean, not every function is invariant. The invariant subspace is one specific sub subspace, but there are other subspaces as well. Right? There's actually a decomposition into uh, irreducible representations of GLM. Uh, actually, both of them decompose uh, independently into, uh, into irreducibles. And well, um, yeah, some of them are actually invariants, which is one specific, um, one specific lambda stands for the invariants, right? And, and the others are not invariants, but there are some other types, okay? And then we're counting here how many of these specific types occur, right? Um, one of these y lambdas here, for example, is the dimension of the invariant space and um, one, yeah, and the corresponding lambda, uh, right, the same lambda here is the z lambda as corresponds also to the invariant space, but the others are there as well. Now, Schur's lemma says that uh, in this situation, if there's a surjection here, then we always have that the multiplicities of z, uh, the z multiplicities are greater or equal to the y multiplicities, right? And now, oh, if this does not happen, then we get what is called a multiplicity obstruction. So if we have that the z is actually less than the y, then this is called a multiplicity obstruction. And if the z is even zero, then this is called an occurrence obstruction. And yeah, so this is the, the big theorem I have with um, Burgesser and Panova is that you cannot um, actually use occurrence obstructions to obtain here in the case number one, super polynomial uh, lower bounds. It's impossible to do this um, because the, I mean, yeah, we just prove that they don't exist. Right? We prove that, that and the problem is the z equals zero. So we basically we construct explicitly um, uh, witnesses that these z lambdas are non-zero. We explicitly construct these things and show those are those lie in in this coordinate ring, and that that's it basically. And uh, so the hope is the hope uh, that is formulated in Mulder and Savoni was definitely that these uh, obstructions, these occurrence obstructions, should work. But there's a more general philosophy actually in this paper, and um, it's the following. It says, I mean, okay, so first of all, why should occurrence obstruction even 
uh, be a thing? Why should they work? So the philosophy is the following. You have orbit closures that you want to compare of two points that are characterized by their symmetries, right? And now, if they are characterized by their symmetries, the hope is that the obstructions should be obtainable actually from these symmetries. And you have symmetry groups, and, um, and there's a good reason for that. And I try to, yeah, I try to highlight why there's a good reason to believe this here in this talk, right? So here, for example, you have a the, the permanent the permanent and uh, the IMP polynomial. They are characterized by the symmetries. You want to use the symmetries to uh, explicit to, to find an explicit obstruction. Uh, so they are talking about occurrence obstructions, but you can also do this. Of course, you can try to find a multiplicity obstruction. And indeed, in this talk here, we will do exactly that. We will use the um, we will use the symmetries of these two points to actually explicitly ex uh, exhibit a multiplicity obstruction. It will not be an occurrence obstruction, and this we will also prove it's not going to be an occurrence obstruction. All right, uh, let me be more precise here. Uh, let me actually okay. Let me postpone being precise for a second. So let me just uh, say okay um, about the about the uh, the stabilizers and being characterized by the stabilizer and where this hope comes from because it's sometimes overlooked. Um, a point is characterized by the stabilizer. This is a, actually a very beautiful notion. Um, if whenever you have any point um, that has symmetries that has at least the symmetries of uh, of, a, uh, of the point P. So you have a second point Q that has all the symmetries of P, but might be more symmetries. Then we know already that Q must be a multiple of P. Uh, so, so they have the same stabilizer. This also says they have the same stabilizer. So there is only one point that has the symmetries of, of your point. If your point's characterized by the stabilizer, then no other point has these symmetries. They will always lack some symmetries or, or up to scale. And actually, many points are characterized by their stabilizer. It's actually most of the ones that we care about are actually uh, characterized by their stabilizer. Right. So that is a um, very good notion, maybe to have a look at. Certainly, because our points do have these properties. Now, um, this one here is easy to see. Uh, for points that are characterized by their stabilizer, actually something very nice happens. It's that the orbit. The orbit of a, so these three things here, these three objects here, can be um, if you know one of them, you know the other two. Um, not not in any reasonable algorithmic way, but uh, in a in a way of there's a unique object that uh, satisfies this. I mean, I'm not saying you can actually find it efficiently, but uh, certainly it's it's possible to determine it. For example, if you have the orbit, then how then you can be just I mean, this is the closure operation. You close it, you get the closure. Right? Nothing, nothing deep happening here. If you have the closure, you take a point from the interior and take its orbit, you get the orbit back. Right. So this is uh, you just get, this is back and forth, and uh, yeah. And if you have the orbit, you can also just take a stabilizer of a point in the orbit, right? and it gives you the stabilizer up to conjugation. Those are all the same. And if you have the stabilizer, since your point is characterized by the stabilizer, you get the point back or up to up to a group action. Right? So these are all the same, definitely, if your points characterized by the stabilizer. That's not super impressive yet. That's um, what is very nice is that we can link this to multiplicities, actually, in, certain, in, a, in, in a certain situation. And that is not always, well, actually, this is this is like highly work in progress because this is not going to um, solve any of our problems yet. but. People have looked at what happens to the multiplicities. If your point's poorly stable, like the SL orbit is closed, then under technical assumptions that are not true in GCT, right? So these things are not true. This is just what you need here. G must be a compact leaf group, stabilizer must be connected, and C to the M must be an irreducible stabilizer representation. In that case, if that's the case, then we can actually say not only one, two, and three, can be reconstructed from each other, but also four and five will also yield exactly the same information in this specific setup. Um, those are the multiplicities in the coordinate ring of the orbit and the multiplicities in the coordinate ring of the orbit closure. If you know the multiplicities uh, in the coordinate ring of the orbit closure, then you can for sure actually uh, determine the ones in the orbit by just going to very high degrees, and then you will uh, reconstruct the ones in the orbit. 
So that's not a problem. And for the ones in the orbit, the paper by you here, this paper now actually says that from the multiplicities in the orbit, you can actually get the stabilizer back. Right, and then if you have the stabilizer, you can go to like the closure, and from the closure, you get the multiplicities in the coin ring of the orbit closure, and then you're, it's all linked. Right, so these are all the same in this setup. Um, so that is great because this that tells us that these multiplicities, I mean, they they capture the whole information about the point. So it is it is reasonable to think that they might help actually in um, finding the separations. It's not it's not clear. I'm not saying it's a theorem. Just uh, pointing out that this is this is a fact so now and also just pointing out the caveat that this is not working yet in the situations that we want um also of course because there are extremely few people working on this right to to push this in the direction that we want and because it might not actually be completely true in the situations that we want there might be some caveats that uh, there might be some special properties that we need additionally to in addition to this and uh, so it's just unclear at the moment. Okay, so what we do know though is that there is a uh, that we we can actually use the multiplicities to uh, in the in the case that I uh, said and the power sum versus the product, and we do use the stabilizer. And how is the stabilizer usually used to? So the stabilizer is the so when I say stabilizer, I mean this is a group of symmetries of the point. Right? And I want to say, so how is the point? How how are how is the stabilizer used to find obstructions? Okay, um, so the orbit itself is um, actually also an algebraic variety, and it lies open in its closure, right? So it's not in the ambient space; it's not Zariski closed, right? So this is makes this thing a bit uh, a nasty object from the other. But on the other hand, it's actually reasonable to look at it independent of its embedding right so once you embed it you will usually take the closure and that's usually the more complicated object actually so it lies open in its closure and it has a, a ring of regular functions on the orbit um, this means that you can actually you are allowed so if you look at this in the ambient space so say you, you have your usual space of um, of polynomials now you have your orbit um, sitting inside then what you are allowed to do is you are allowed to divide by fun by polynomials that are non-zero everywhere. That's that's okay now. So you, this is uh, you are allowed to divide by these polynomials. So for example, if you yeah, I always do discriminant in my examples. So here, if you are looking at um, the GL two um, orbit of x one squared, um, that gives you a linear forms squared, right? So and um, but you know the discriminant doesn't vanish on those, right? I actually, well, actually, uh, am I messing this up? I think I might be messing this up. Yeah, it does vanish. I think. It does vanish. So this is exactly what you should not be doing. Yeah, should <laughs> should not be doing this. So this is not in so this is not in there. Okay, so I can now oh, I can use now the the property that I have here. My ah. Can I, this might have messed it up now because I can never close this again. No, I can actually, good. I can actually, so this is good. I will never be able to, this app does not allow me to delete this, but I can, doesn't, don't have to delete it. It's just wrong, okay? So this is not a function that you want to use because that one's just, uh, yeah, you're dividing by something you're not supposed to divide by. Okay. Um, so it's a, bit, it's a bit a weird situation, right? This quadratic of the orbit is a bit weird. Uh, from a perspective of the ambient space, because it's not only polynomials, you, you're allowed to divide by things. Now, um, but it is a subring. So the quadrant of the orbit closure is, uh, so every function where you don't divide by anything is, is uh, certainly a function where you are allowed to divide by something. So that is a subring. It lies, it lies inside as a subring, which is great because we can now compare multiplicities. So this is this is commonly used actually. This has been used in, in several papers by now. It gives an extremely nice upper bound on the multiplicities that you are um, interested in, right? We are interested in these multiplicities here. And these here are extremely nice to compute. Well, these ones are extremely difficult to compute because there's an orbit closure here. And these ones are nice to compute because this, this orbit here is in, um, you don't have to care about the ambient space. You basically only have to care about the symmetries of your point P. 
and this completely describes all the these multiplicities. Actually, these um, yeah. So this is related to the symmetries of the point P very closely. So what you need is the stabilizer of the point P, and we do know these. So for example, here this is for the power sum. I just listed it. Uh, we we've seen in the other talk as well. Right, this is a cyclic group with a wreath product of the symmetric group. So here you can, well, I mean for this power sum. Yeah, you can you can raise x one, uh, so you can multiply x one by a dth root of unity and will not change the power sum, right? And also you are allowed to exchange the number of summons here. It's not going to do anything. Okay. Um, now uh, we also know it for the for the product, which is the um, the torus of the special linear group with a semi direct product of the symmetric group. So you are yeah. So you're allowed to rescale. You're allowed to rescale here the variables. But you just have to take care that uh, the product of the rescalings is one, and you are also allowed to switch the order of the uh, variables. And this is extremely classical for the determinant. For example, this has been determined by Frobenius um, very early on, but we don't have we don't talk about the determinant uh, right now. And uh, so the algebraic Peter Weyl theorem is what what makes this all possible. What makes it possible to actually compute this multiplicity, so this upper bound you can compute by, by, by a nice formula. Um, yeah, maybe let me just say this. this so, but before I want to, before I dive into this theorem, I want to tell you that this here is extremely simple. This, uh, this calculation is you take an irreducible of the, of the general linear group and you look at how many, in, so what's the dimension of the space of H invariants? And H is a stabilizer of your point. That's it. And you can, this is, you can do this, you can do it on your computer, you can do it on a piece of paper, small examples. So this is a linear algebra calculation, basically. Um, okay, so, uh, okay, how, is, how, how does this work? Why does this work? So the orbit is actually equal to the uh, set of cosets by the stabilizer. It's also, also very explicit here. There are some caveats to be done, but this is all GLM and characteristic zero, so everything is actually quite nice. And yeah, so you still have a GLM action. And uh, this means the coordinate ring is actually the H invariant ring of the coordinate ring of the group. So this object is cool. It's uh, you take the group itself as a variety and you have an action from the left and from the right on uh, the functions on the group. And you take the right H invariance. Right, and and uh, we do know exactly how the coordinate ring of the group decomposes, and that is written here. And so right, this is as a GL cross GL module. It decomposes like this. It looks a bit like the sure vial duality that we've seen, which is actually it's closely related to the sure vial duality actually. And uh, so this takes right H invariance here. So this means if you look at the at the multiplicity of lambda now in this thing. Uh, which means, well, what does it even mean multiplicity of lambda? So by the left action, you want to see how many um, summons of lambda are here. Well, this is its multiplicity space, right? So this is the dimension of this space is how many lambdas actually appear. So it's the dimension of the H invariant space. And now, yeah, so you can calculate this in many, many cases can be calculated using the stabilizer and just some representation theoretic branching rules. So for the determinant, for example, we get what is called the uh, symmetric rectangular Kronecker -like coefficients. And for the product, we get a plethysm coefficient, which we will see this is helpful actually. And for the power sum, we get something that is a bit more complicated. I don't want to go into the details, but there is a formula um, that is a sum of several Bs and the Bs here are sums over little root richardson coefficients and products of pathisms. So the only things that happen here is a sum of products of little root richardson coefficients and pathism coefficients, both very well-known coefficients in um, representation theory, right? So these are very classical. So for the power sum, we know exactly what's happening and we have a formula, right? So this is nothing to do with, there's no geometry happening here. This is, this is a flat formula. You can just plug into your computer. It calculates the multiplicity. Right, that you can actually analyze it, also prove things about it. Perfectly nice. So now this is just a slide listing the different approaches uh, that that have been done with these um, different obstructions. And so the determinant versus determinant, um, we proved 
and this is what I said, we proved that there are no occurrence obstructions. We actually earlier proved um, that there are no occurrence obstructions using this upper bound here from the from this slide, right? So this upper bound, where um, where you actually you get an upper bound on one multiplicity, and the other one you have to somehow get a lower bound. Uh, however, you want to do that, but uh, using this upper bound uh, exactly in this fashion here with this dimension, this is what I call here on the next slide the uh, stabilizer upper bound. Okay. And we proved uh, so this this was actually a conjecture by Mumer and Sohoni that this stabilizer upper bound would actually lead to occurrence obstruction. So this was the uh, the main paper that actually shows that this is impossible. And now you can you can lift it to the closure. This is basically what has been done in the second paper. We don't know in this case here about multiplicity obstructions. Um, we do have a, a paper that says multiplicity obstructions are stronger than occurrence obstructions, where we do construct a case where we have, um, this is called a, the power sum versus the product of linear forms and few variables. And in that case, we actually show that, yes, there are multiplicity obstructions, actually even uh, via the stabilizer upper bound. So I, I've just write yes, because it follows from the other yes, right? So it just follows immediately. And, and we prove no, there are no occurrence obstructions, right? So I'm also not, of course, not using the stabilizer upper bound. So this means that, uh, that indeed there are cases where the multiplicity obstructions are stronger than the occurrence obstructions. In a sense, it says we don't have to be extremely discouraged by just not having the occurrence obstructions here. This might be a more of a natural thing actually to not have the occurrence obstructions. Um, but on the other hand, we also have a result that yes, sometimes they do work. So we have, uh, if you compare the matrix multiplication and the unit tensor, then yeah, you can actually find occurrence obstructions even with the stabilizer upper bound here. Yeah, so it gives, a, it gives a stabilizer upper bound, but now all of these have a problem. All of these, these um, papers have the same deal with the, have to deal with the same issue that you want to compare two multiplicities. You get an upper bound on one, well, where do you get the lower bound for the other one from? You have to like, compare two things, right? You need to know two things. It's an upper bound method is not enough to compare two things. Yeah, if you just have upper bounds on both. Uh, yeah. So what we do, we just go around it and like explicitly do multilinear algebra to construct these um, multiplicities, to construct lower bounds on the multiplicities by explicitly constructing highest weight vectors. That's extremely cumbersome and is also not intended in the Moimelizogoni papers in the original ones. The original ones say you should use the symmetries of the two polynomials like to compare the two multiplicities without explicitly telling us how, but it says that, right? Um, and uh, so what we do now in this paper is that uh, we show a tight connection between the uh, between the coordinate of the orbit and the orbit closure for the power sum. So we can use the upper bound for the product polynomial, and we can use the upper bound also for the power sum, but we show that the upper bound for the power sum is tight. So we also get a lower bound for the power sum. Uh, in certain cases, it's not always tight. It cannot be always tight. But in the cases that we have, it's actually tight. The lower bound is tight. The connection is extremely close. So this gives a lower bound on the one side and upper bound on the other side. And this gives us an obstruction. Here it is. So we take the, um, yeah, we take the orbit closure of the product. We take the orbit closure of the power sum. Okay, and this is lambda here, extremely explicit. This is, this is literally 4m, 2m, 2m, up to 2m is a list of m numbers. m minus one of them are 2m, one is 4m. Well, I mean, can't be more explicit than that. I mean, almost not. This is extremely explicit. And uh, we, do multi we do now determine these two multiplicities. This is, uh, one of them is just at most one. This is class just classically by the upper bound that I showed you with the algebraic Peter Weyl theorem. And this one here is two, where right? the upper bound is two, it's, but it's also tight for the power sum. We also see that this is not an occurrence obstruction because this is not going to be zero uh, under the assumption that the alon tausi conjecture holds for this M. So this is the conjecture about Latin squares. And we know that this is true for, for prime plus one or prime minus one. So in most cases, infinitely many cases, as to say that, in infinitely many cases, this is not an occurrence obstruction. On the other hand, this number here could also be higher 
because there are potentially more polynomials here, um, more highest weight vectors of this weight lambda. Uh, in fact, uh, we calculated that this is at least a dimension three vector space. So this obstruction here is neither an occurrence obstruction nor, so because this one is not at, as it's at, not at its limit, but this one's also not at its limit, right? So we call it a, I'm mean, not sure if this uh, useful notion, but a, a vanishing ideal occurrence obstruction. So it's not that, right? It's not at its limit. The other ones actually before they were at its limit. So the one here, this one here is actually at its limit. It's actually an occurrence, uh, a vanishing ideal occurrence obstruction. So, yeah, so this proves uh, that, yeah, this embedding cannot be, it cannot be true, right? There cannot be an embedding like this. And uh, this is not a, the power sum is not a product. Okay, I already said this is a toy problem. And I also already said that, yeah, so you're using the two symmetry groups, you know, to do this. All right, so the first thing is we want to, so two things we need to prove to actually make this happen is, uh, yeah, there's, there's these two, um, well, one, one inequality here and here an inequality would be enough here, right? So two greater equal to, um, what? Now this one greater equal to two would actually be sufficient. Uh, the equality is just, we don't need, really need the equality here. But let's just focus on the orange part here for a second. And uh, yeah, so this is just classically done. So you have that the, the multiplicity is bounded exactly by the algebraic Peter Weyl theorem technology by the multiplicity in the quantum ring of the orbit. So you're allowed to divide now. That's okay, because the upper bound is still good enough. Because we know exactly the stabilizer of this, uh, of this point, we can uh, go through all the notions and find that this is a specific plethysm coefficient, which is upper bounded also. We know this from uh, classical results, the plethysm coefficient is upper bounded by a specific Koska number, which is the number of semi-standard tableaus of a shape lambda with the numbers one up to n exactly delta times. So this is a completely explicit construction. And uh, for this specific lambda, there's only one such tableau, which one can write down. Here, this is the example. It's, I mean, it looks, looks close, to, to, close to trivial. Once you know these things, it looks close to trivial. You have to find a tableau of the same shape, of this shape, and you put into it um, numbers one up to four, but uh, each number is there, you have to put it 10 times and you want it to be semi-standard. So that's exactly this one here. There's no other tableau of this that has this property, right? Um, yeah, that, there's not much to it. Um, this is the upper bound. So you get an upper bound of one here. And that was never, I mean, also in the other papers, this was really, uh, well, it's, it's not easy to find the lambdas where you have these nice upper bounds, but, um, but the, the new ingredient here now is to actually get a, a handle on the right hand side, uh, on the left hand side here. And this is done by the fundamental invariant, gives a very close connection between the orbit and the closure. Um, yeah, so if points are polystable, then we get, uh, then the theory actually tells us that there's an extremely close connection between the orbit and the closure. Yeah, so if your points are pulley stable, this means their SL orbit is closed. It's not always so easy to actually find out if an SL orbit is closed, but uh, I'll not be concerned with that in this talk. This is certainly an interesting, uh, interesting question. So these one here are actually pulley stable. Right? All I mean, the IMP is also I just forgot to list, right? So they are they are all pulley stable. Now, if your point is pulley stable, then there is actually a unique invariant, SLM invariant in your uh, coordinate ring uh, that is of smallest degree. And there's only one of it. And it cuts out the boundary of, uh, of the orbit closure with all, without the orbit. And uh, yeah, so this shows the connection between, I mean, if you have that fact that it's cut out by this invariant, then you know that the coordinate ring of the orbit is exactly the localization of your, um, Coordinating of the orbit closure at the invariant uh, phi. So it cuts out the boundary and, uh, and now you're allowed to divide by the things, uh, by, by this polynomial, right? It's non-zero on your whole orbit. So that's perfectly fine. You now divide by it. Um, 
Yeah, and this is a so this is the localization. Localization is you take a ring and you formally also allow it to divide by the element uh, phi. You get formal quotients, right? So that's the localization. And yeah, we call it the fundamental invariant. So that invariant, and this already says is extremely close. It doesn't solve our problem yet. Because if somebody gives you if somebody gives you a function now here in this quantum of the orbit, then still you only know that okay, okay there's some way of writing it as a polynomial divided by some fairly maybe fairly high power of the fundamental invariant. So without a bound on the power of the fundamental invariant that you have in the denominator, there's not much that you can do. But uh, so you can interpret our result here as actually giving a bound on the degree of the fundamental invariant in the denominator. Uh, in the case of the power sum, if P is the power sum. Because we know actually a lot about the invariant, uh, this specific fundamental invariant here uh, in the case of the power sum. This is uh, a very, very nice and uh, simple function for even uh, degrees. For odd degrees is actually already, it's, it, it already gets subtle when your degree is odd because we only know the invariant here under certain, uh, certain uh, restrictions. But for even D, this is extremely nice. So this is what we mostly do. And uh, we also know it for the product, but also this is, gives us some combinatorial headaches here, right? So you need this uh, conjecture about Latin squares to be true. Otherwise, we don't know exactly how this looks like. So we know it in infinitely many cases. Okay, so this, that's the fundamental invariant. That's a theoretical perspective to the fundamental invariant. So we know that this thing exists. And that is very helpful, definitely, but we don't actually require that for the proof. The proof, the proof works actually without even knowing that it exists. And in hindsight, you see, ah, I did like some power with the with the fundamental invariant. Do you don't actually need it for the proof? All right. Um, yeah. So this gives an okay. This is again the theorem that we want to we want to have a look now at the at how we get a two here. And we do get a two just from this formula. Um, the formula, uh, yeah, so the B was a bit fairly complicated uh, expression, but we can, uh, I mean, when, once we plug in such a simple lambda here, then the, this one also simplifies quite a lot and you can easily actually compute that this is two. But at the moment, this only gives an upper bound on the multiplicity that we are searching, right? Uh, this one here is equal to that one here, right? So this is two. We want to see that this is actually equal to two. Gives an upper bound only. Now the the theorem is that under certain um, under certain assumptions, we actually do have that these two are the same. So you need some assumptions on on lambda. Um, yeah, it's a bit uh, it's a bit messy. I mean, you want uh, d is even is the easier case. Um, then you have you can define e rho as uh, some sum over uh, yeah so, so some slightly simpler sum if d is odd then things get a bit more slightly more messy you what you want to have is you want to you're starting with your lambda now you're counting in your lambda the number of m by m blocks so now now let me actually draw something I might I might mess up this slide but uh, no that was not a good thing I want to I do want to get yeah there you go. So what you are counting is, so you have your young tableau here, and now you want to see how many, um, maybe like that. That's your young tableau. I'm just writing over the text, sorry for that. So there's um, how many m by m blocks do I have in my in my young diagram for lambda? Right, you're just counting those, and that's the number uh, that is called. Uh, k here, right? And that number must be high enough. If that number is high enough, then you're in good shape. That's basically what it's saying. So if k is greater or equal to e, e is computed by some um, notion on uh, on rho, where yeah, where you yeah, and you're summing over the rows that are um, Okay, so it's okay. It's a, it, it is a, it is a bit complicated. So you have to talk about what d is, and uh, here in this setup, and d would be the degree of the remaining part that you have here. I mean, anyway, so everything has expressions in, um, and everything is a fairly natural notion. Uh, but I mean, the main idea, maybe the the main thing that you can get away from this is that you need a, a number of of these boxes that is high enough, right? Um, 
And in our case, that is the case because look, I mean, our, our thing here actually is designed in a fashion that is, uh, it's, it's just two big blocks. Right? So this is extremely simple. The design is made so that this is just, uh, well, it's 2M. So there's two of these square blocks. And then there's just a long line, All right? That's it. And that's M and M. So this is your Lambda actually. So it has two of the blocks and the rest is extremely simple so that all the um, requirements are satisfied here in this case. So this is how it's designed. Okay, and in that case, we, we know that this is true. So now um, that is nice. So how can, could one possibly um, prove something like this? And I do want to give you some idea of how one could, uh, could possibly prove something like this with these. And, and where maybe give some idea of where does the number of large squares come from? Because it sounds like a, I mean, if you are not familiar with young tableaus, uh, then you don't, you wouldn't, then it's not so clear to you. But if you are, I mean, so, so a square, I mean, so basically a square is like a, a power of the fundamental invariant, basically. So let me, um, let me try to give some idea of how this is proved. This is proved using highest weight vectors. So, okay, so this is a technical theorem again. On top, I'm not gonna go into the details. I give you some idea of, of, of where actually, of, of any connection that could be made between the quadratic of the orbit and the orbit closure. And you will see that if you spin this far enough, then you will get basically this theorem out of it. And this is done by highest weight vectors. So instead of talking about the multiplicities and counting the number of occurrences uh, of representations here in the left and the right-hand side, what we do is we look at highest weight vectors and uh, highest weight vector is, has, uh, yeah, comes up fairly often in my talks, right? So if you have a, a vector F in a representation V, it's called a highest weight vector of some weight lambda if two things are true. So first thing is that you, if you have a diagonal matrix acting on your vector F, then it should rescale. So your vector should just rescale alpha one times lambda one up to alpha m times lambda m times f. So that's what should happen, should properly rescale. And an upper triangular matrix should just actually fix your vector f. And if that's the case, then, then this is the highest weight vector. They do form a vector space. Uh, yeah, so any linear combination is still a highest weight vector of the same weight. But if you, two, if you have linear combinations of, weight, uh, of highest weight vectors of weight lambda, that's still a highest weight vector of weight lambda. Let me just say this is like HWV lambda. Okay, it's a it's a sub vector, it's a linear subspace here. And it turns out that the multiplicity of lambda is exactly the dimension uh, of the highest weight vector space. So this means that we can try to prove this by just looking at the highest weight vectors on the left and on the right, and that is perfectly possible to just try to connect these two. Um, and, and show that the dimension is the same. But I mean, how would you prove that the dimension is the same? We will actually prove that as, as functions on G, these are the same functions. This is what we're gonna prove. And then the dimension will also be the same. Okay, so this is, um, I, I was talking a bit about young tableaus, but uh, need to be a tiny bit, um, maybe just remind you, like this is a young tableau when you actually write numbers in your tableau, not just having a young diagram, but putting numbers in it is called a young tableau. It has a content, is the list of uh, like numbers of ones, numbers of twos and so on. Uh, for example, the content here of this tableau is three, 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 because there's three ones, three twos, three threes and three fours. Uh, young tableau is semi-standard if each column is increasing and uh, like here, one, two, three, four is increasing, one, three, four increasing and every row is um, non-decreasing, like weakly increasing, one, 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 two, two, monotone increasing but not strictly monotone. And the super standard tableau, right? Where you have uh, only I in row I. Okay, so those are the tableaus that uh, are of interest here. And we quotient out, as we've seen in my last talk, by the shuffle relations. This is usually what we do. Um, so we will, for this talk, we will only need the simple shuffle relation here, which says that, um, Two tableaus are the, two tableaus differ in sign if you um, if you switch two entries in a 
in a column. Actually, we will only need a simpler version of this. The only thing that we need is actually a tableau is zero if it has a repeated entry in a column. That's the only thing that we need, right? So this is the only thing that we need for the shuffle relations. So you think you can think of actually of a vector space, um, of a vector space of tableaus where you, where you cannot have repeated columns. That's that's perfectly legitimate for most of the things. Maybe you want the sign change property. Uh, okay, you have an action on the vector space. Uh, we've seen this last time where you're replacing a, um, a one by a one plus two. Then, uh, yeah, what is it doing? It's uh, it, it's expanded multilinearly, multilinearly, right? So the one plus two is going to be these these four here, and you're going to um, these one and this one here and these three. These actually, did I mess it up? I think I did. Yep, this is this is wrong. So this is uh, wrong because there's this two is not there. That's just a one, because this is this is zero, this is zero, this is zero, and that one of them survives only. So this is going to be just that tableau. Okay, so that's how you do computation with tableaus. Now, um, if I, if you have a map that maps numbers to other numbers then you can apply this to a tableau as well, of course, right? So here is a map, um, here is a map. So you have a tableau, you have a map, you define it completely naively, right? So you have, say your map says ones are mapped to twos, twos are mapped to twos, threes are mapped to ones, then you apply it to the tableau, you get this tableau here, where the ones are mapped to twos, right? The twos are now twos again, right? And the threes are ones. Now this is gonna vanish, all right, this is got, this is the zero vector because there's a repeated two in the first column, right? So that's that's that, and you can um, define the orbit average by saying, okay, I'm summing over all of these uh, maps and uh, over the tableaus. For example, here M three two is you're taking your tableau and you are replacing now every number by a number from one or two. Uh, on in all possible ways so there's three numbers in your input so you get an output of eight doubles here you're summing up all these eight doubles that's going to be zero here in this case because you only have two symbols but the first column has three boxes so there will always be a repeated one so that that's going to be zero but uh, obviously not always going to be zero right uh, and the other thing is the symmetrization where you just take a tableau and you just permute the entries um so once once are going to be twos Two's going to be threes, things like this, right? So you apply this here um, to the tableau, and you get these six tableaus here that are just arise by permutation. Now this is also going to be zero, but it's not so obvious to see that this is going to be zero in this case. But it is. It's not extremely difficult, um, but it's also not. I mean, I don't think it's worth it right now. But it's going to be also zero, right? So you can actually do the if you use the shuffle relations now. You will see that this one here cancels out with that one here. So if you add them up, it's going to be zero. That one cancels with this, and this one cancels with that. This was not, not nothing deep, but it's uh, so it might also. So sometimes they are zero, sometimes they are non-zero. And now you can actually prove the theorem in this fashion. So you you want to prove that the multiplicities are the same. So what you use is a a description of the highest weight vectors using these tableaus. So the highest weight vector space, this is what we've seen last time, is generated by functions that uh, you're mapping a G to the inner product with this super standard tableau. You're applying G um, to the um, orbit uh, averaging of T, right? Uh, and for every T, you get a function. So for every T, so T is a semi-standard tableau of shape lambda in which each entry one up to delta appears exactly capital D times. So for each of these tableaus, you get a function. So the function might be zero because uh, M delta MT might just be zero, right? And there has nothing to do. The function might be the zero function. The function might be linearly dependent to some other function that you have. So the tableau itself is a bit difficult to see actually from the tableau uh, itself, if this gives you actually some non-zero function or not, or um, if they are linearly independent or not, it's a bit difficult to see. But this is just a theorem at this point. And uh, you have a very similar theorem for the um, functions on the coordinate ring of the orbit, in the coordinate ring of the orbit. 
So here it's almost, it's not exactly the same. It's, it is very similar. So you do get, um, you do get actually a decomposition now in several spaces. And the row is a partition of, of the degree delta. So you partition the degree again. Um, and now you, instead of taking your M delta M, you just take your PM. And that's okay because now your, your Tableau does not actually have delta many different entries. Your Tableau only has M many different entries. And the row tells you what is the, what is the I mean, how many uh, of the different types type are there. So the content is row times D. Um, I'll show you in a second. But uh, the, the main difference is here that this Tableau here has delta different numbers. This Tableau only has M different numbers in it. And uh, this Tableau has every number appearing exactly the same time. This here says every number appears a multiple of D times. This has exactly D times. So that's slightly different, but I mean, it's not so crazy that you, I mean, we will see that we can actually deal with that. So here's an example of, um, of a Tableau where we just apply the symmetrization. So this just, uh, this is copied from the other slide, right? Let's do an example with one of these uh, lambdas here. You get a tableau S. That's a tableau where, yeah, not every number appears the same amount of times. Uh, there's one number that appears um, three times, eight times, and the other one just appears exactly eight times. So this is what this row says, right? And now, yeah, so this is kind of how this tableau looks like, and we can symmetrize it. And when we symmetrize it, um, the following happens. So you would get all types of permutations here, but now you are using the fact that uh, you can just reorder them. So you switch the entries in a column and get a sign change. So this is one of the shuffle relations. And since this is an even number of columns here, the number of sign changes to put everything back to, to normal, to the identity is actually gonna be an even number of sign changes. So you don't actually have to care about this whole block at all. There's just, it will, the, the, the action will not actually affect this block. The actual will affect the long block here, right? So from the eight factorial many different terms that you would get, you actually get only eight of them are different and they each come with a multiplicity of the seven factorial then, right? So this is, you just do like all the eight factorial permutations. So here's a one and just here's an eight, right? So one up to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's the only difference between these, these things here. And that's, um, yeah, so that's that's P8S. And this describes, like, uh, basically describes the part of the function. Um, now, if you could find a Tableau where, well, let me maybe say this. If you could now find a Tableau where M delta MT is also this, uh, exactly this, um, this sum, this eight Tableaus, then this is exactly the same function, right? You see that this will be, if PMS is equal to M delta MT, that's the same function, right? And indeed, this is possible. So this is the main idea. So if you take a tableau like this, say this is your tableau S here, then you can generate a tableau T, which is, uh, I color code it. Um, so the colors are just for convenience. It's not, I mean, the tableau, the, the color is not, not something that relates, it's not a property of the tableau. Tableau just has numbers, so I don't have a number. This has 10 different numbers. Each number appears exactly the same number of times. Um, and now if you evaluate, well, if, if you now apply the orbit average on this, so you, what you have to do, what's the operation? You have to replace the 10 different numbers by numbers one up to eight, right? And each, each number is replaced. So the four is replaced to, I don't know, with, with a one maybe, or the, the five, or maybe the four is replaced with a two and the five is replaced with a three or something like this. And you're replacing all of these here. Let's just ignore the red ones for a second, but you are replacing these. And uh, you are not allowed to do a repeat. If you do a repeat, then this is gonna be a zero vector anyway, right? So if you do a repeated column, a repeated entry in a column, and this means that you have seven of your eight numbers you already picked. So there's one last number that you haven't picked yet. Well, now, so, so now there's only one number left. So, so all the red numbers here, the one, the two, and the three, they appear here at right? one, two, and three. They all have to be set to that last number because otherwise it's going to be zero, right? So um, otherwise the tableau is going to be zero. This means they all have to be set to the same number. 
And this means that you get the same number here in the end, well, which leads to this, right? M108T is also seven factorial times this, right? This is the same. This is exactly the same. So what you, what you started with is a highest rate vector in the coordinate ring of the orbit. And what you constructed is a highest rate vector in the coordinate ring of the orbit closure. And that is not, I mean, it's not clear that this is always possible. And why would it always be possible? What you needed here is this trick with these blocks, right? Where you're just forcing the, the specific numbers. Right? This is a trick that you are using. You need the full blocks for that. And this, so this um, basically says the, this, uh, yeah. So the proof works if you have enough of these blocks, then you can, you can simulate any tableau behavior that you want uh, using this description. Right, and you just need enough blocks for that. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so this proofs now, your, right? Yes. Sorry, this is your condition on K. It's a condition on K, yes. It's just K has to be large enough, that is true. Okay. And K is in the, so it's the number of M by M blocks, which is the power of the fundamental invariant. If that's high enough, you can do it. And uh, and by this combinatorial construction, we prove, uh, we give an upper bound on, on by, by just looking at the tableau, combinatorics uh, and what kind of um, things we need here to make this construction work, we give a complete explicit upper bound on, on the number of, of blocks that are there, which is exactly the, um, the power of the fundamental invariant in the denominator. I mean, we get, uh, it's just that we get a bound on that. Right? I mean, we don't determine it exactly, we just get a bound on that. And it's, yeah, it's good enough for our purposes here at least. Yeah, and that is um, that is the proof idea. So uh, it shows now, well, maybe just recapping this, we want to uh, prove that these two are the same, right? Uh, yeah, we re relate these two extremely closely uh, by saying that, yeah, if, if um, the number of M by M blocks is large enough, then these are actually the same, right? Uh, yeah, we prove it with this, right? We, we prove by, by simulating the tableau behavior of one tableau under P, uh, by the exact same tableau behavior under M from the other tableau. So that is uh, that is how it's done. And then this is the same, which proves then this theorem, right? Because now this is two, perfectly fine. And the two follows just by picking a lambda that has enough, um, enough uh, a, a large enough number of rows. And we don't have to care actually, at this point, we don't have to care about like, explicitly how does, for example, how does the tableau actually look like in the end? We don't need to know that. The construction says that um, any tableau, uh, any two, say, say in this case, any two linearly independent functions on the coordinate ring of the orbit that you start with will give you two linearly independent functions on the coordinate ring of the or uh, orbit closure and uh, independent of how they look like. So you don't actually have to determine the invariance. So it's completely sufficient to just uh, evaluate the formula using the representation theoretic branching rules. You just use the branching rules and you compute, oh, it's two, and then yeah, there will be two invariants. There will be these two functions in the orbit closure. I don't know how they look like. I don't know how the tableau looks like. And you could determine how the tableau looks like by explicitly determining the functions in the coordinate of the orbit, but uh, it's not necessary to do that. But you could now go through the whole proof, trace the proof basically by, and then in this way construct the function, but it's not necessary. You can do without. Um, yeah, okay. So just to summarize, uh, yeah, so first thing is, uh, is a bit simple, right? The power sum does not factor. It's a bit of, it's a bit, a lot of machinery for that, right? Uh, and so this is shown using explicit multiplicity obstructions and they are not, uh, this is extremely explicit. It shows um, that this works. They are not occurrence obstructions. At least we know that in infinitely many cases, they are not vanishing ideal occurrence obstructions. Right? So they lie interestingly, interestingly in the middle is also because they are constructed just from the stabilizers. They do not look at the ambient space. Right? So you don't, want to, you don't look at the ambient space and then you just don't end up with any, any edge case on the ambient space, apparently. Yeah, so now both, both multiplicities are obtained using the representation theoretic branching formulas, uh, yeah, is achieved for the power sum by an extreme close connection um, of these two objects, the coordinate of the orbit and the orbit closure for the power sum, right? We know it for the power sum. Uh, it's not clear at the moment 
which one should be the next one where we can actually push such a thing through. It's not it's not so clear. Right? Power sum is certainly so was certainly the easiest one, and so that's the first one that we were able to do this. Yes, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there questions? Uh, yes, one, one question. How far are you from proving a, 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 a lower bound for the warring rank of uh, x1 times x2 times xm? Like, for instance, you know, the, the bounds that are known, that have been oh. known for a long time uh, using, say, partial derivatives. Yes, that is the reason. other way around. That is that is the other way. You, so you want to do it the other way around. Um, which makes a lot, yeah, which, which I mean, admittedly makes, of course, more sense because the warring rank is actually a um, respected computational model while just showing that something's not a point. I mean, something is a part of linear forms is, is of interest, but it's of course, yeah. warring rank would be nicer, of course, right? Yeah, yeah I yes, completely yes. agree. So one should try to get, yeah, how far, it's difficult to say how far one is in, in, in these matters. It's not so easy to, to analyze these. Um, I mean, you already have the equations for the warring rank. So the only thing that you would need to do is to analyze the representation theoretic decomposition of those. It's sometimes it's not so easy to do that. It's sometimes not so easy to do that. I, I know some people who actually looked into that, um, but I'm not sure if they actually, got anywhere i also don't so I, okay i i don't know anybody who actually is actively working on classifying the representation theoretic data of these equations at the moment mm -hmm. i don't know of anybody who's doing that at the moment well, there might be someone but I'm not aware that people are doing that okay. i agree that that would actually be interesting one should probably try to do that because we have the equation it's just a, it's a matter of if we can analyze them well enough. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? So, so maybe I can ask one, one question. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, many times that it's a toy example. Yes, yes. Um, what, what are the natural uh, non-toy examples that you could you think could be easily reached? Uh, you know, what directions, what, what are the difficulties so, in getting more complex examples? Yes. So if, there's, if there would be a non-toy example that I could do at the moment, I probably would do that actually. Um, so the, but you are completely correct. So what would one want? So is it actually doing it? Yes, it's doing it. So one, first of all, I think, I think, I mean, there's, I think there's no way around doing small steps. So one of the small steps that is necessary, I think, to advancing actually to even advance further, is to remove the fact that these two polynomials have the same number of variables. So they are both they are both concise in the same space. And that's not what you want when you want to have some proper comparison of, of two functions. So one, one is a hard function, one is a measure of complexity. These will not have the same, I mean, they, they, they will most likely not have the same number of variables. So that is that is needed to be removed. And I would, even go so far as to say the next usual, the next reasonable step should be to actually do this in a toy case, because there's another there's a, actually from this toy case there is the next toy case is already missing, but we don't even have that yet. And uh, but I do think it's possible, and and I'm actively searching for uh, measures of complexity that are suitable to be treated with these methods that are simple enough to be treated with these methods and i i agree that that warring rank is uh, is ex looks extremely tempting looks extremely nice and natural to actually be studied with these 
methods also but also it's not uh it's not so easy right it's not not so very easy but i do agree and i look at some other things um where where there might be something possible or not and uh well it's always it's always i don't know i mean it seems to be like uh, always a bit between like how far do you want to go from a from a computational model to a toy example and uh, and you have to somehow uh, so the compute we are not there we can't we can't do it for for the actual computation models yet it's just we don't know it doesn't it's just machine we don't have the machinery yet it's just missing um so we need to uh, yeah we just need more machinery at the moment otherwise th this is at least this is not gonna gonna do it just yet um there's some yeah so there are some steps so if, um i would say next step is definitely try to get rid of this problem so that we have some machinery that works in a actually fairly general case and then one has to of course replace the well, this works for the hard polynomial being the power sum. One could try to do some other things then. I can say, okay, if I understand the power sum as a hard polynomial, maybe I want to prove some non-trivial properties of the power sum by replacing now the, the product with something else, right? Which that would be, for example, like a possibility that I could think of is, is reasonable. Maybe you want to prove something some models slow up. I mean, this is all toy examples still, but uh, maybe some non-trivial ones are possible. Maybe you can show that a specific power sum is not expressible as a as a specific like iterated matrix uh, multiplication polynomial, or maybe some determinant or something like this. So, so these things are seem to be more in reach at the moment with the current technology. It's just. Uh, yeah, and, and these steps also needed, they, they need to be done first. So otherwise, I think this is going to be, yeah. Th those are steps that are necessary, I think, um, to advance. So that's okay. So slow and steady steps. Right? Slow and steady, yeah. Slow, I mean, <laughs> I would think, I mean, there's, of course, some occasional big paper breakthrough, and I'm always really happy to read about those. Slow, there's no... No doubt about that. Yep. So one part of my question was also, so you say that the uh, uh, mechanisms are not ready, so the tools are not there, but maybe you, you get an idea of what's needed, right? Yes, yes, we do get an idea of what's needed. We do get an idea of what's needed. So, um, and I think what's needed is definitely the polystable needs to be removed. We do get an idea um, that the hard polynomial in the, at the moment uh, was never the focus of study that far. So at the moment, we can only do it for the hard polynomial being the power sum, so which is also a bit restrictive. Right? So we have to definitely also work on that. And those are two, two points where you have to work on. So the, the other polynomial here, we do actually have some, um, yeah, we do have formulas. I mean, determinant is the symmetric Kronecker coefficient. And the uh, we also know the formulas for the iterated matrix product. So that's, I mean, there, there are a lot of a lot of parts where one can advance. I mean, there are so many, so many parts where one needs to push this a lot further. Um, it's just so much to do. It's just um, yeah. One and it's also not that we are actually hitting a wall anywhere where we just say, oh, this is gonna be never gonna be solvable. So I don't think. Yeah, I haven't seen anything where just where I would say it's like completely impossible. I will tell you when when that happens. Great. Hopefully, we will not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, thank you very much again. Thank you.